You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. And our scripture reading for today is taken from 2nd of Samuel, chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Emil at Lodibar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Emil at Lodibar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, Why is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then a king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and all to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. These are the true words of the living God. Thanks be to God. Help us to respond with faith. Thank you, Dara. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, the other day, I was walking home from the train station, and a fairly regular occurrence happened, which was someone was there collecting money and asking me to donate, and they were asking me to donate money for some people who are unwell in Singapore, um, I think terminally ill, and uh, they were talking through what those needs were, and I'm sure many of us have had experiences like this uh, on a regular basis. In fact, these kinds of experiences and the expectation that people will give and be generous toward those in need is something that I think in our culture, by and large, we take for granted. But I wonder how many of us recognize just how unusual this actually is. The world has not been this way all through the ages. Uh, Tom Holland, um, whenever I talk about Tom Holland and my family, I have to clarify to my children, I'm not talking about Spider-Man. I'm talking about the historian, Tom Holland, and my kids get very sad when they hear that. But Tom Holland uh, studied classical, the classical period, and he was fascinated with ancient Rome and the Greeks, uh, assuming that, that so much of our culture uh, was built upon that way of thinking. But the more he studied this classical period as a Westerner, he says himself that he increasingly struggled with a sense of dissonance with what he was reading. And I quote, The more years I spent immersed in the study of cultural antiquity, the more alien I found it. It was not just the extremes of callousness that unsettled me, but the complete lack of any sense that the poor or the weak might have the slightest intrinsic value. Why did I find this disturbing? Because, as I came to realize, in my morals and ethics... I was not a Spartan or a Roman at all. And he came to see 
quite how Christianity and in his book Dominion, he speaks about how Jesus' death and resurrection uh, has shaped the ethic of our world in such a profound way. Friends, in our day and age, uh, even though much of our world in different parts, uh, it has happened in different ways, but in many parts of our world, though it's been shaped by Christian ethic, we still often are prone to despise the weak. We think about the screenings that often happen for uh, pregnant mothers and uh, children maybe with Down syndrome that are often end up being aborted. We often uh, want to take life, and sometimes we, we even do so in the name of compassion, maybe compassion for a child or compassion for a mother. Even in our despising of the weak, we, we find ourselves shaped somewhat by the Christian sense that we should have some care or compassion. Maybe as Christians, we know that caring for the weak and the poor is something important, but maybe we're inclined because we know this is the right thing to do, to do so, but we like to do it from a distance. Give money to another organization. Let somebody else do it and assuage our conscience. We're happy to give a little bit, but stay away. In our passage today, friends, we see God is very, very different. God invites the weak in to come and eat at his table. Today is one of the most beautiful passages uh, in the Bible. Here we see, friends, a picture of David, King David at his best, a picture of him as the true king. The context, as we heard last Sunday from Jacob, is that David is at the height of his power. Uh, chapter 8 told us that all of David's enemies have been defeated. Verse 14 and 15, let's put up our next slide, tell us, the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel and he administered justice and equity to all the people. Friends, David here is at the height of his power, dominion. He has victory wherever he goes. And the question is, how is David going to act as one in power? How is he going to use his power? And so chapter 9, verse 1 begins in a somewhat strange way. It's not what we'd expect for someone who's been exalted as king. David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Friends, here David, at the height of his power, is seeking to show kindness. Is this you and I? We're going to explore this today and see that because God treats his enemies with this unusual kindness, we as God's people are to respond by firstly receiving it and secondly demonstrating it. And we're going to ask some simple points. Who receives the king's kindness? What is, this king, what is the king's kindness? Why the king shows his kindness? And what this means for us today. So let's dive in. Who receives the king's kindness? David inquires in verse 1, if anyone is left of the house of Saul, and David ends up discovering uh, a young man by the name of Mephibosheth. Now, who was Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth, the passage tells us, was the son of Jonathan. Remember, David's old friend. Now, Jonathan was the son of Saul. So Mephibosheth is a grandson of Saul. And uh, I quickly counted this morning when I was in my office, Saul, or the house of Saul, is mentioned seven times in these 13 verses. It's emphasized again and again. Uh, the fact that Mephibosheth was of the house of Saul meant that he was in line to the throne when Saul died. He was a part of Ishbosheth's family. Remember how in chapter 2 and 4 we heard about Ishbosheth, who Abner installed as the king, even though he knew David had been anointed to be the king. So Mephibosheth here, the point is, he is a former rival of David. He's part of this house that has opposed David and seeks a sort to put David to death. And it was customary in those days that when a rival power came to power, you would exterminate all of the remaining relatives of the previous house so that nobody could claim uh, any, no one could have any claim to the throne. And normally, Mephibosheth would have just been put to death so that no one could challenge David's role at all. Mephibosheth, here we see, friends, is someone who has uh, sided against David and his rule. He is a sinner opposed to God's king. But that's not all about Mephibosheth. The passage tells us that he was crippled in his feet. The last verse tells us he was crippled in both of his feet. In fact, this detail is mentioned three times in 2 Samuel, twice in this chapter. Chapter 4 of 2 Samuel, a couple of weeks ago, told us how Mephibosheth became crippled. He became crippled because when news that Saul had died 
reached the family, the family, fearing for their lives, uh, took up everyone and they fled for safety. And the nanny who was carrying Mephibosheth in haste dropped him as a young child. And both his feet were broken. And since that day, he was crippled. Friends, this meant Mephibosheth could not work. Uh, there was no, um, he couldn't just sit behind a computer and work. He couldn't work the field. He couldn't fight. He was utterly dependent on others. In fact, this chapter and later on, it seems that Ziba, who we'll see in a while, uh, has actually taken advantage of Mephibosheth's land and his weakness. This is someone who's been abused and taken advantage of because of his disability. So he's not only a sinner opposed to God's king, he is a lifelong sufferer at the same time. And his name, Mephibosheth, means shame scatterer, one who uh, scatters shame. The the passage tells us in verse 4 and 5 that he's living in a place called Lo-Debar, which translated means no word or no thing. This is someone full of shame, living in a no-name, worthless place. And in Verse 8, when he comes before David, he refers to himself as a dead dog. Now, friends, dogs in those days weren't household pets. I have a beautiful golden retriever, uh, and that's not what Mephibosheth is talking about. He's not talking about a dog that you loved, man's best friend that happened to pass away. Dogs were considered unclean. They were not in, in, in houses. Uh, and so when Mephibosheth refers to himself as a dead dog, He is not uh, saying anything remotely positive. A shame scatterer living in nowhere, crippled, formerly opposed to the king. This was his experience. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be him? I was, uh, again, walking to the train. Uh, About 10 days ago, this passage was on my mind, and I saw a young man kind of hobbling across the road in my direction. Uh, He must have been 17 or 18, and one of his legs was not working properly, and he was kind of dragging his his leg. There were not many people around, and I thought to myself, I don't know what I can do for him, but what I could probably do is look him in the eye and just give him the warmest, biggest smile that I can possibly give him. Help him feel seen and loved in some way. And I looked at him, and I waited for him to make eye contact, and he didn't. He didn't. He just kept his head down and dragged his foot and passed by. Friends, we may listen to this and we may be thinking, okay, all right, I know where the sermon's going. We have some people who struggle in these kinds of ways in RHC. Let's really try and be a far more caring church. Before we get to that, friends, actually commentators tell us that Mephibosheth is a picture of every single one of us in our fallen state. We may think in our self-sufficient lives that we don't need the Lord's kindness. We may have created a safe little space for us, carved out a little empire for us where we maybe look good to ourselves and have some measure of stability and security in our condos, with our cars, with our titles at work, maybe our designer clothes. But friends, The scriptures tell us, apart from God's kindness, every one of us is a Mephibosheth, estranged from God as his enemy, crippled inside, either with guilt for sins that we've committed or or shame, imposter syndrome, possibly. And friends, I find as a pastor that these things are true, even for some of the most successful among us. It reminded me this week of a quote by Soren Kierkegaard, who said, I have just returned from a party of which I was the life and soul. Witty banter flowed from my lips. Everyone laughed and admired me. Dash. But I came away. Indeed, that dash should be as long as the radii of the Earth's orbit. Dot, dot, dot. Wanting to shoot myself. Friends, many of us, despite our external success, and there are many who have a lot of success here at RHC, 
still have an inner bankruptcy, an inner shame, an inner guilt, an inner struggle. It's amazing to me how many successful people here I speak to who, when they're really being honest, describe that sense of imposter syndrome that they feel in their workplace. The only way back, friends, is through undeserved kindness. What? So let's have a look and see what the king's kindness is. Let's imagine here, friends, Mephibosheth. He's living in low Debar. He's flying under the radar. He's glad he's flying under the radar. Better that David doesn't know about him. He technically is still a threat to David. Better for him to be weak and hidden than dead. And suddenly what happens? There's a knock at the door. Who's there? Soldiers. And the moments that he has feared in his nightmares for years finally comes. His heart is racing. What does he discover? The king has discovered you. The king summons you. Friends, can you imagine for a moment Mephibosheth's fears? He must have been utterly terrified. And the passage tells us that they bring him over to David. Can you imagine the, the, the fears and the thoughts that are going through his mind? The plethora of options. You know, will his life be put to an end? Will he be paraded? Will he be tortured? His mind was, would probably, as many of us do in situations like that, run wild. And how does David address him? What happens? In verse 6, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, there's that reference again to Saul, came to David, fell on his face. And he's, just, he, he's utterly dependent, falls on his face, pays homage. And David said, now there's an interesting detail in the text here. Up until this point where David's been interacting with Ziba, his, the servant, David is referred to again and again as King David by his title. And suddenly here, David is addressed in the first person. David, not just the king, not just his role, but a person. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, do not fear. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. And you shall eat at my table always. What is going on here? Friends, David uh, treats him with this grace. He treats him in a personal way. He addresses him by name. He assures him, do not fear. And then he begins to make these outrageous promises to him, saying that he's going to show him kindness for the sake of his father, Jonathan. Now, what exactly is this kindness? This passage, these 13 verses, mention this word kindness three times. Verse 1, verse 3, and verse 7. So it's emphasized here. This word kindness is the Hebrew word chesed, which is a word that we see throughout the Psalms, throughout the Old Testament again and again. It is the covenantal, steadfast, committed love of God. This is a word that is so rich that is very hard to just summarize in a very succinct way. It means goodness, love, in a covenant faith, in a covenantally faithful way. And this is what David says he wants to give, he wants to lavish upon Mephibosheth. Now, let's double click on this. What exactly does this kindness look like? David's going to offer him protection. David says to him, do not fear. Do not fear. I will show you kindness. I mean, Mephibosheth should have been afraid as an enemy. And yet, do not be afraid. I will show you kindness. Friends, this is someone who's been picked out on the, on the school playground for all of his days, been an utterly dependent upon others. And now the most powerful man in the nation says, don't be afraid. I'm going to show you kindness. Secondly, provision. David promises him the return of all of the land that belonged to his father Saul. Why didn't Mephibosheth had it? It seems like Zeb and others had taken advantage of him and were cultivating that. Later, there's a reference to Zeba's household and his servants. And Zeba actually seems to have got very, very wealthy off of Mephibosheth, it seems like. And, and uh, David says, I'm going to re return this to you. In other words, David's saying, I'm not just going to give you a handout and kind of feed you daily. I'm going to empower you with real wealth. And then, amazingly, as if that's not all, he's going to give him position. Mephibosheth, for the rest of your days, you're going to come and eat at the king's table. The text tells us, like one of the king's sons, adopted into the family, 
This is Mephibosheth being, having a fellowship, inclusion, and relationship, a sense of restored dignity. Friends, imagine living in low Debar. I was trying to think about a place in Singapore that correlates to low Debar. I don't think there is such a place in Singapore. You have to maybe find some small village that's not even on the map in Malaysia to find some equivalent. And suddenly he's brought in and he's, he's eating at the king's table. Now, friends, I want to ask you this morning, what kind of kindness is this? What kind of kindness is this? And amazingly, verse 3 tells us. Verse 3, David says, bring him to me so that I can show him the kindness of of God. Lest you think, I love this story, and I'm going to try and correlate David and say, you know, this is what God's like, but actually David was just really feeling good that day, but that's not really what God's like. No, friends. David says, I, let me show him the kindness of God. Remember, friends, this is David at his best, showing us the king's kindness. So I'd like to ask us all this morning, what deep down in our hearts do we conceive God to be like? What do we deep down believe him to be like? Is he kind? To me, kindness has a different kind of feel even to love. It's like you can love someone and be very committed to do the right thing, but inside you're like still quite hard or uh, like willing yourself to do the right thing. Kindness has like a tenderness to it. A gentleness. Let me show him the kindness of God. One of my favorite verses is Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus says, love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return, your reward will be great. And if you act like that, you then will be sons of the Most High. You'll be like your father. For, look at this, he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Friends, do you know how I feel when people are ungrateful <laughs> toward me? Let me just tell you, my first reaction is not necessarily kindness. Like, after all I've done for you, you're going to treat me like that? But what's in the heart of God? He is kind. He is tender. To who? To the ungrateful. And to the evil. Friends, some of you have been brought up believing that God hates all sinners, can't stand you, has to hold his nose in your presence, and somehow has found a way to just about tolerate you because of Jesus. But if it weren't for Jesus, you'd be toast. Now, friends, God is absolutely holy, and God is righteous, and sin really is a problem. It really is a problem. I don't want to minimize that at all this morning. But here, friends, God is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Friends, this is staggering, not because it makes us think God is not holy, but because it, in a sense, redefines or shapes what God's holiness is really like. Holiness means separate or other. Holiness doesn't just mean pure. Holiness means Every attribute that God has is like on a different plane or different level to how we are inclined to think about it. And part of that equation is God's kindness even to his enemies. Now, why does David do this? Why does David show this kindness to Mephibosheth? And this is our third point, why the king shows his kindness. Let's go back to verse 1. David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. What is it about Jonathan? If you've been here over the last number of weeks and months, we've been going through 1 Samuel, now 2 Samuel, you'll know from 1 Samuel that David and Jonathan had a very, very deep friendship. 1 Samuel chapter 18, uh, verse 3 says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. They loved each other very, very deeply. Alec Motia says, I rejoice in a Christian love that the passing of time cannot erode. We see something of that here. But in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, uh, Jonathan double-clicks on this covenant. 
Jonathan says, if I'm still alive, this is what Jonathan asked David. If I'm still alive, show me the steadfast love, the kindness, it's that same phrase, that he said, love of the Lord, saying, David, please, show me God's kindness that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house, the house of Saul, forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Friends, what's happening here? Jonathan realizes Saul, his dad, is against David. But he recognizes David's been anointed the king. And so Jonathan sees that the writing's on the wall. And he says, David, I know you're going to be exalted. And ruin is going to come to the house of Saul. And he says, if I'm still alive when you're exalted king, please don't just treat me as one of uh, your enemies, but treat me with the, with the covenant love of the Lord so that I will not die. And don't cut your steadfast love from my house, my descendants, even when I know God's going to deal with all of your enemies. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. My friends, I get choked up just thinking about the, the the love between these, these two people. David here, friends, is showing kindness, the kindness of the Lord to Mephibosheth. Why? Because of a promise that he has made with his father, Jonathan. And this, undersc- and this underscores the point. The kindness here, friends, is not because Mephibosheth is awesome, but because David has made a covenant with Jonathan. Th- this promise is the key. In other words, This is not just a Disney story. What happens in a Disney story? Someone discovers a princess. She's disheveled, but actually is like incredibly beautiful. And as soon as she's cleaned up, she's like absolutely stunning. And she's like a princess some more. And, you know, and suddenly the story has a happy ending. This is a better story than that. Because, friends, none of us here, I speak for myself in particular, I won't speak for the ladies, but certainly for myself, none of us here are beautiful princesses. We're Mephibosheth. To use a phrase that someone else used, we are the girl that nobody wanted. But Romans 6 says, Romans 6 says, while we were weak, while we were weak, crippled in both feet, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Then on to verse 10. For if while we were enemies, I mean, it's the same language, right? With the weak, Mephibosheth, enemies. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Friends, Christ died for those, for us while we were weak. While we were his enemies. And Jesus Christ, friends, is God's kindness to us. Jesus, friends, takes the consequences of Mephibosheth's rebellion against God and ours. And Jesus enters into Mephibosheth's shame at the cross. Jesus hanging naked there as he enters into our shame in what theologians call the divine exchange so that you and I can be brought in. And God treats us with kindness, not on the basis of our intrinsic worthiness. We do have intrinsic dignity because we're made in His image, but treats us with kindness because of the covenant, the the, the covenant that He mediates. We are treated well, friends, the Bible says, because we are in Jesus. We are in Christ. We took our place. This is the staggering message of Christianity. If you're here and you're exploring, exploring the Christian faith and you've been told through your life, the Christian message is, look, do, do good, try harder. Friends, that's not the primary message of the Bible. The primary message of the Bible is that we have not done better. We have turned away from God. But God has not left us that way, but has pursued us in love. And through Jesus has come to make us his. Jesus has taken our place at the cross. He's died a sinner's death and he's risen again. So that through our faith in him, we may be folded into the people of God. So what is it? And, but the key here, friends, is that we are in Christ. We're in him. Now, what does it look like for us to receive God's loving kindness? Protection. 
Think about what the angel says after Jesus is risen from the dead. And those disciples are like terrified. What is happening? And the angel says, do not be afraid. Why? Our sins have been paid for by Jesus. We're no longer opposed to God. And so Jesus comes to his disciples in John 20 verse 19 and says, peace be with you. What about provision? The Holy Spirit, friends, giving us every spiritual blessing in Christ. He will never leave us or forsake us. And moreover, what about the position we have? Not being tolerated by God, but being folded in as his sons and his daughters. Eating at the table. We're going to take communion in a moment. We're going to literally have a foretaste of what this is going to be like one day, where we feast with God forever. Adopted like sons and daughters. Fellowship with him. When I was thinking through these points uh, this week, I couldn't help but remember Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Look at this. All three elements. Speaking about what happens as God's children. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back to fear. You've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Friends, this is what God has done for us in Christ. This is the King's kindness to us. Protection, no fear, the spirit poured out into us. Received as sons and daughters of God. And friends, how does this change your view of God this morning? Now, I know some of you this morning are probably thinking, okay, yes, Simon, I understand Jesus died for me, but I still feel weak. I still feel shame. I still feel somewhat broken. I still have this limp. Friends, look at how this passage ends at verse 13. The last verse Mephibosheth has been restored. He's living in David's house. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always the rest of his days at the king's table. Now, he was lame in both his feet. Friends, this man lived as a lame crippled at the king's table for the rest of his days. There was still a limp. He wasn't entirely fixed. But even in the midst of his brokenness, he had fellowship. He had provision. He had the king's favor. He was part of the inner talk, dinner, dinner time talk in the royal house. Friends, for all of us here today, in some way, shape, or form, there is a sense in which all of us are walking with the limp. Every single one of us, friends, we live and walk with a limp. But in God's kingdom, we do so with our heads held high. We do so in Christ with those who are at the Father's table. A beautiful line in Leviticus chapter 26, God says, I broke the bars of your slavery and I enabled you to walk with heads held high. Friends, I don't know who you are here today, but God wants to invite you, you as you wait that day where your crippled legs will be fully healed, when one day Jesus wipes away every tear and fixes everything that's broken in this world, as you wait for that day, yeah, we still have limbs. We may still have brokenness, but we walk with our heads held high. Your deformity this morning, it shall not rob you of the privileges of sonship. It is no bar to sonship. So finally this morning, what does this mean for us? What what does this kindness mean for our lives today? And two things I want to encourage us in. Firstly, I want to encourage us this morning to receive this kindness from God. Friends, the previous passage did see judgment for God's enemies who didn't receive his kindness. We must enter into the covenant through our faith in Jesus. By faith, we must see Jesus who has given us his kindness and we must receive it. We must come to his table. Those who are too afraid of God or think he would never accept you or never love you will never come in faith. You must see Jesus and then draw near in faith today. And part of this involves seeing, recognizing our own sin and our own weakness. Otherwise, some of us may be too proud to come and accept Jesus, broken and bloody for us. I want to encourage us this morning as God's people, friends, as a church, not to come to church on a Sunday and present all of our strengths to God. 
not coming presenting all of our all the things that we've done so well, all of our um, great moments, all of our skills and abilities, but coming with our sins and our sufferings. Because welcome at his table is not based on our behavior, but Christ's covenant. When, when, when God sees us, friends, he sees in us his son, Jesus. And we're to see ourselves this way. Charles Spurgeon says it so beautifully. He said, Mephibosheth was not an attractive guest at the royal table. Yet, he had an open invitation because King David could see in his face the features of the beloved Jonathan that he loved. Like Mephibosheth, we may exclaim to the king of glory, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? But still the Lord invites us to share intimately with him because he sees in our countenances the remembrance of his dearly beloved Jesus. Friends, isn't this so, so beautiful? But friends, I want to encourage us to say that receiving God's kindness is and must be transformative for us as well. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. I want us to think about this for a moment. It is God's goodness and His kindness that leads us into a life that is conformed to his image and confesses our sins to him and then seeks to follow him. Think about Mephibosheth here. The king's kindness has been given to him, and what does he do? He now comes and he sits at the king's table. He's feasting with the king day by day. He can't sit at the king's, at like David's table every day, and while he's doing that, he's still, I don't know, snacking on his tins of sardines or his, I don't know, you know, one meat, two veg or something from uh, his $2.50 lunch that he brings in himself. He can't do that. He's at the king's table now. You're being provided for. You honor the king with what he's given you. Friends, what does this mean for us today? Uh, this sermon may be taking a turn that some of you weren't expecting, but let's talk about greed f- for a moment. Uh, friends, in our nation, the excessive wealth in our nation has a huge blinding effect upon us. Jesus says, be on your guard for all different kinds of greed. I wish you be on your, on, your, on your guard for kinds because greed is sneaky. There are many of us friends that put so much of our confidence in our financial savings and our wealth. And for some of us, friends, doing that is like Mephibosheth coming to the king's table, refusing to receive the king's provision and hoarding our own self-sufficiency. And it's robbing us of of true life, friends. For some of us, Jesus may well be saying to us, like to the rich young ruler, give away everything you have, or certainly divest yourself of a lot of what you have, and come and follow me. Friends, we don't need to hoard. We don't need to be greedy. We've been invited to the king's table. Or maybe for some of us, it's not greed. it's, It's slander. Those juicy morsels at the office water cooler that you love sharing about colleagues or other people because it makes you feel so much better about your own state. And it's a means of, when you speak down about others, it's a means of making yourself feel better about yourself. Friends, but you're seated at the king's table. You've received his kindness and his love. You're involved in the conversations. He loves you. He's given himself for you. You don't need to do that anymore. You can lay that aside. Maybe for some, it's obsessive, compulsive dating, treating dating like it's going to be some kind of a fix for all of your internal problems. If God plans to give you a partner, I'm sure that will be a great blessing to you. But I want to say to you this morning, you're seated at the king's table. You've been invited. So let's receive God's kindness and let's let God's kindness lead us to repentance. And finally, let's give this kindness because of God. Friends, I want us to remember what Jonathan said to David and what David says in this passage in chapter 20. Jonathan said to him, show me the steadfast love, the hesed love of the Lord. Think about that for a moment. Jonathan is saying to David, hey, David, you have the ability to show me something of God's kindness. You can give this. You can demonstrate it. Can you give it to me? 
Friends, we can give this to others. How is David able, able to do so? What prompts David in, in this chapter to suddenly think one fine day, is there anyone left of the house of Jonathan, uh, the house of Saul that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? It's interesting that this chapter comes after chapter 8. It seems David, having been granted much victory in chapter 8, is reflecting on what it means to be the recipient of God's kindness to him. If you remember, two Sundays ago, Ekyong preached in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and what does David say when God makes the covenant with him and says, I'll provide for you and your family forever? What does David say? King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you've bought me thus far? You know, what's interesting is Mephibosheth says something similar. Who am I? Who am I? that you would treat a dead dog like me, like this. Friends, David has understood something of God's covenantal kindness to him. Think about God's kindness to David through First and Second Samuel. And when David is experiencing this and living in this, he suddenly wants to now give this to other people. Friends, the extent to which we sit in and receive God's kindness is the extent to which we can give this to others. So for those married here this morning, can I encourage you that God's steadfast covenantal love should make us committers in our marriages through good and bad to demonstrate this steadfast love? Those of us who are members of the church, we've been folded into the new covenant. We have this covenant that Jesus has made with us, and we are all it brought into this covenant. And so there are some kind of covenantal obligations we have toward one another. It's not the same as marriage. It's not until death do you part. You could move on to another church for sure. But this local body, there's an expression we have where we live out these relationships with one another. We watch out for one another. We pray for one another. We follow up with one another. We speak God's truth and love unto one another. We're covenant brothers and sisters here with this kind of love. Or we can show this to, through hospitality in church, inviting others into our homes, letting them get to know us and see our lives. Can I encourage us to do some of that? We spoke about Christian love earlier, Alec Martyr. I rejoice in a Christian love that time does not weaken. What about those who are actually very obviously weaker in our church body? If we're going to be a church that's marked by the, the covenant love of God, friends, we're going to have all kinds of people in our church and not see them as something to be tolerated while the rest of us try and get on with our strong lives, but seeing this as representing the very heart of God and thinking, how do we help them to experience this loving kindness of God? And maybe, friends, even for our enemies. Let's remember Luke chapter 6, verse 35. God is un kind to even the ungrateful and the evil, just like you and I. Friends, Tom Holland is this, the historian on Spider-Man, is seriously on his way to exploring the Christian faith, attending church, who for years did not believe in the Christian God at all. He came to see just how much our world has been shaped by the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He began to study it more and more. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I'd invite you to explore Jesus too and to receive his covenant kindness in your life by acknowledging your weakness, turning from your sin, and putting your faith in him. Let's pray. Can I invite the worship team to come? We're going to go straight into a, uh, some songs and sing. In response now, uh, let's bring our hearts before God. Father God, as we sung this morning, who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you? We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be at work in our hearts to help us to see and to comprehend how high and deep and wide and great is the love of God. To receive it, to live it out. We ask this in Jesus' name. 
You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.